we're going to try to wrap up this series where we've been dealing with give no place to the enemy. Amen. Don't give Satan a seat in your life. In order for him to do anything to you, in order for him to, to get an advantage over you, you have to give place. Now, we've looked at a lot of information concerning that. And a lot of times, it's not that for most of us, it's not that we just automatically uh, just allow Satan to do what he wants to do. A lot of times it comes to, number one, either disobedience, you just didn't listen to God. But for the most of us in here, it's usually through ignorance because we just didn't know what we were doing when we did it. And so we've come, we've been going down through the information and we've been reading the scriptures and we've been seeing what, we've been seeing what, they're, what they're saying. And we came across the scripture that said that on last week where it says it's through his commands or through his word, he, uh, he makes us wiser than, the, than, our, than our adversaries. And I read that for you out of the uh, message Bible, I believe it was. It says that through his commands or through his Age, words, or we, we get the advantage over the enemy. Instead of him having an advantage over us, through the word of God, we gain advantage over him. In other words, we begin to see things the way God sees them. And when we begin to see things the way God sees them, it's hard for the enemy to lie to you. Because when you have the light of the word of God in an area, it is very difficult for you to be deceived in the area where the light is. The only way that you can be deceived in anything is when there is no light of God's word in that area. Now you're not quite sure what's truth or not. So <clears throat> let's look here at something here that I think is going to help as we get back to what we're looking at. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. And then we're going to hurry back over to Proverbs 4 here in a second, but I want to put this in here this morning because it came up in my heart this morning. So I want us to look at it. First Peter chapter two, and I want to read verse 11 for you out of the Amplified Bible. It says, beloved, I implore you as aliens and strangers and exiles in this world. Now notice we're in the world, but we're not of it. To abstain from sensual urges. It didn't say sexual. It says sensual. The evil desires and passions of your flesh, your Lord nature, that wage war against your soul. So he says that you abstain, separate yourself, uh, discard the sensual urges or the pressures that's applied to your flesh. Ear, feel, taste, the and things touch. Don't, in other words, don't allow those pressures to govern your life because those things are warring against your soul, soulish man. It didn't say it's warring against your spirit. It says it's warring against your soul. In other words, it is warring against how you perceive things. If all you're focused on is the outer pressures of life, then your perception and your focus is wrong. You are going to be deceived because if it's out here in the realm of the scene, it can be manipulated by the devil. <coughs> it says it wars against your soul. It wars against how you process things. It wars against how you see things. Your spirit man is saying one thing, but the pressures of life are showing you something different. And if you're taking those things in, that is what's governing your life instead of your spirit man governing your life. And if you're focused on that long enough, what begins to happen is that soulish and body begins to strengthen while your spirit man is weakening. Now, take that over to Romans chapter 8, and I'll show you why. Now, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus 
who walk not after the flesh. Now, we just got to talk about the flesh, warn against your soul. Who walks not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, what we can say there is this. There is therefore now no condemnation. Now, what is condemnation? Condemnation is a judgmental feeling of wrong, guilt, and shame that, that comes over you to make you feel unworthy. When you're engaging and you're following those evil pressures that are in the sense realm and you fall to them, the right, right away after that is taking place. Now, for instance, let me give you an example. You're getting ready to end up in a fornication situation. Now, leading up to it, there's a sense tugging on you that that's wrong. You use a resistance not to do it. But if you're being, if you're going to allow yourself to be succum to, to succumb to those pressures, after a while, that feeling of wrong goes away. And you just go ahead on and do it. And while you're in the middle of it, you aren't thinking anything spiritual. You're actually enjoying yourself, whatever it is. And, and, but when it's over, right away, the enemy does what? Brings condemnation. See, I thought you were saved. You said you weren't going to do that again. What is he trying to do? See, he's warring against your soul. He's trying to, he's trying to suppress, suppress you to oppress you so that he can keep you in the posture of being defeated. Well, the word of God says that, but if I walk after the spirit, now, how do you walk after the spirit? It doesn't just necessarily mean following the, the, the leaders of the Holy Spirit. And, and but it does primary, mean that the primary thought here is walking after the word of God. What does the word say about that? What are you to meditate the word of God, live in the word of God, practice the word of God. For they that walk after the word of God following the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what he's saying here. For there is no condemnation at all to those who walk after the spirit instead of their flesh. So that's telling me that if you're, if you're following the dictates of the sensual nature, you're going to live a condemned life. That's what it says. But now notice, go on, let's look here at verse uh, 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind. They set their minds, they set their thoughts on the things of the flesh. The sensual world. But they that are after the spirit of the word of God, they set their mind on the things of the word of God. For to be carnal minded, sensual minded, flesh minded, all three are the same thing, is what? Death. Now that doesn't necessarily mean dying. That word death could also carry the meaning of separating. So it says here, for the carnal minded person it is death, or to be carnal-minded is separation from the things of the Spirit. That's what happened to Adam in the Garden of Eden. He experienced death. Now, he didn't cease from living. What happened? He was cut off from the supernatural life in God. So to be carnally minded to be governed by the sensual realm... If that's governing your life, it's blocking you or it's preventing you from seeing the realm of the spirit. You can't walk in both at the same time. So it says it separates you. It, it produces death. But to be spiritual minded is life and peace. To be spiritual minded, to be word minded, to be God minded produces the life of wholeness. That's what peace means. Because the carnal, fleshly, central mind is enmity against God or it wars against God, for it is not subject to the law or to the word of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are of the flesh cannot please God. Notice that. You see how it's worn against your soul? 
It says, they that live underneath these carnal, fleshly, sensual impulses and pressures. It says, that is a carnal-minded man. And it says, the carnal-minded man cannot submit, it will not submit, and it cannot please God. Why? What pleases God? What pleases God? Faith. Where does faith come from? The Word. But if you're walking by your senses, if you're walking by the corner of fleshly man, you are not living by faith. Therefore, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to get anything done in your life. Without faith, you do not have the advantage over the enemy. Because the realm of faith is the realm where we have the advantage over the devil and the central realm is the realm that he has advantage over you. Now, prove that to you. James chapter 1 says this about that. Now, if we look at James chapter 1, verse 21 from the Amplified Bible, it says, So get rid of all uncleanliness and rapid outgrowth of wickedness. Get rid of that carnal nature. And in an humble, generous, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word which implanted and rooted in your heart contains the power to save your soul. It's the word of God that's in your heart. The word of God that's sown in there by the spirit of God that you meditate, that you stir up, that you live by. It contains the power to save your soul or renew your mind so that you can walk in the realm of the spirit with God. And you have the advantage over the enemy. This is why you go to church. This is why you read your Bible. This is why you meditate scriptures. Not because it's the right thing to do. No, you need your mind renewed. You need, just like the scripture says, we're not ignorant of the enemy's tactics. You need the word of God to show you, to expose, to shine the light of God's word into your life so that you can learn and begin to see how do I keep falling in the same thing? Because there is a reason why you keep falling to the same thing. There is a reason why the enemy continues to get advantage of you in the same area. There is a reason why it continues to happen. It just doesn't happen because it happens. No, it happens because that's the area that you refuse to let the word of God change you in. And because of it, you are not strong enough, full of faith enough to stand in that area and you continue to bow your knee to the central realm. And as long as you continue to do that, you're going to be deceived. You're deceived if something's going on in your life and you don't use the word of God and the spirit of God to help you out of it, you, you assume you're strong enough, I can handle this myself. You're deceived. That's like when the word of God tells you flee fornication, that means run. You deceive if you think you can go on, and, you know, go on out to the movies and y'all sit up in the movies all half the night, all hugged up, rubbed up and everything else, and then y'all go drive out and park your car underneath a dark tree and y'all sit there all night. And you, you deceive if you think you're going to be able to withstand all that when the word of God already don't told you, flee that. And you guys know, kind of have an idea what, I, what I'm saying here. You, you, you're deceived. You put yourself in a compromising position because you refuse to do what the word of God says. Now, one or two things happen there. Either you don't know that that's in the word of God and you just was ignorant that there, there's, you got, he's getting, Satan has an advantage over you, or you disobeyed it. Either way, you lose. The devil don't say, well, they don't know about this area over here, so we, we're not going to attack them in that. No, that's the very area he's probably going to hit you in because there would be no resistance there. If you know that you have a problem with, 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 uh, with um, shopping, well, you don't put yourself underneath the central pressures of impulse spending. You decide if you, well, I can handle it. If you can handle it, you wouldn't be $20,000 in debt. So obviously you can't handle it. 
So why you continue to lie to yourself? See, we play these games with our own selves, and 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 well, we we allow Satan to play minds, mind games with us, and we believe that mess and think that we're strong enough to handle things that you're not strong enough to handle. You need the Word of God in every area of your life because it's the Word of God that contains the power to save your soul, so that you can see it the way God sees it. How are you going to see it the way God sees it if you don't have the word that God, that God is speaking? Can't be done. Can't be done. And you're going to forever find yourself up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, and living a condemned, guilty, shameful life. And that was never the will of God for you. So we're going to have to take the word of God, folks, and live it. Let me tell you something else. You can take an individual, and they may be in church too. They may go to church. They may be saved. And they may be sitting in a congregation that really isn't teaching on a level that they need to be taught on. So they're saved, but they're living still like the world. They're ignorant of the, of the truth. Now, the devil's still attacking their lives, but they're living, they're not living to the full degree of, of, of their inheritance. Then you take the other individual who's in a church, being fed the word of God, being taught the scriptures correctly, but they're looking at the other individual at the other church and they're saying, well, it don't take all that because look what they're doing. No, 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 no. Let me tell you something. You are going to be held to a higher degree of expectation from God because of what you know. To him that knows much is required. You can't say, well, because, you know, well, it ain't happening to them over there, so they ain't seem to be going through it. No, 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 it has nothing to do with it. Now, although the enemies over here were still beating, them, beating, beating on them, there's a level of grace that's going to be helping here trying to get them to see change, change, change. But you know better, and you're continuing to do it. That's a whole other level there, because you have the truth. You just find out being disobedient. Now, you think of yourself as a parent yourself. To your kid that didn't know your expectations, you aren't as harsh with the, with the, with the consequence, are you? But when they fully understood what you meant to do, the consequence may be just a little bit to a little bit severe of a, uh, ne next degree. Why? Because now you were clear on what I said to this individual up here wasn't, but you were clear. For instance, a friend comes to your house, they did the same thing you did. Well, you may say to, to the friend, well, you know, we don't do that here. But you do it. You get hammered. Why? You live here. You know better. Well, the same thing is true with the Word of God. You cannot take the Word of God and try to compare how you live into what they're living. Well, they not have to do that, so why should I have to do that? You have to do it because God is giving you the ability to do it and the Word to do it, and he's giving you the expectation of, of, of doing that. Because you've received the Word, the level of Word that's in you should be putting a demand on how you live your life. You don't bring your, the word down to fit your life. You make your life come up to fit the word of God. Forget what everybody else is doing. I don't care if everybody in the whole world was fornicating. The moment I find in the word of God where it says flee fornication, for me it's over if I'm going to go with God. Because I can't base my success now on what they're doing and how they're succeeding. I got to base it on what I know what God has said. It's that simple, folks. But we allow the enemy to deceive us through, through either willful disobedience or ignorance. Either way, he gains advantage over you. When the Bible says, now, we're not ignorant of Satan's tactics. We shouldn't be. And we're not going to let him gain an advantage over us. Now, let's go back to where we were in Proverbs chapter 4. So we take the word of God. The word of God becomes the central component to a successful life. It's key. 
Now, let's read this again. My son, verse 20, attend to my words. We looked at that. We found out what that means. Attend means to commit, uh, consent, and then submit. The word consent means you agree that it's right. But even agreeing that it's right is not enough. After I agree that it's right, then I have to submit, obey it, and do it. I can say all day long, yes, Lord, I believe that's right. Yes, Lord, I believe I'm supposed to, I, I believe it when I give, I'm supposed to receive. But if I don't ever put a demand on it and submit to it, he ain't never going to receive anything. Well, Lord, I believe that I'm supposed to be healed. I believe it. I see it. It's right there. It's in the word. It says it's right. But if I'm not going to put a demand on that and command this body and start doing things that defy sickness, you may never walk in the full de the measure of your healing. So it's not just enough to consent, agree that it's right. You're going to have to submit to it and do it. So it says here, attend to my words, incline thy ear unto my sayings. So we looked, we looked at that on last week. We got to set your ear, tune your ear to the frequency of the word of God. You know, that requires training. It, there are a lot of voices that are being spoken and that, that, are, that come across uh, your path on a daily basis. Your friends are speaking to you. The world is speaking to you. The devil speaking to you. Media is speaking to you. And God is speaking to you. How do you decipher which voice to listen to? It's simple. The word of God says, they that he, my sheep do what? They hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. Well, in order for you to understand that, you have to understand the culture in which they come out of. And when I begin to study that, what, what, what actually was going on is that when the, when the herdsmen came in from the field, there were only a few pits to put your animals. So you may have had four or five shepherds' animals all in one uh, pit together, in one place together. Well, how do you determine which sheep are yours and which ones aren't? Well, the shepherd would come to the gate, swing the gate open, and whatever he was accustomed to saying or singing or doing, that sheep and the sheep in there would recognize that sound or that voice and those would be the only sheep that moved. Well, how are they used to hearing their shepherd's voice? Because of the time spent out in the field with the sheep. So if you spend no time with God in his presence, in his word, then when all the voices are raging and he's trying to speak, you can't decipher because you spent no time with him. You haven't inclined your ear to hear his sayings. That's the only way you can do it. There, are, there isn't any other way that it's going to happen. You can pray and 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 pray. But if you aren't in the word of God and if you're not in, in, uh, making a point to, to live the word of God, meditate the word of God, study the word of God, let the Holy Spirit minister the word of God to you, it's going to be very difficult for you to recognize his voice when he starts speaking to you. Because the enemy has a way of saying things that may sound right. And you saw him use that tactic on Satan, I mean, on, on Jesus in the garden of, 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 uh, of I mean, out there in the, in, in the wilderness of temptation. Go on and throw yourself off here. Didn't the word say that they'll bear you up in their hands, at least you dash your foot against the stone? He used scripture on him. But you've got to be able to decipher what's God and what's not God. And the only way that happens is through the word. So incline your ear unto his saints. The next one says here, let them not depart from thy eyes. So the next gate here would be your eye gate. We talked about your ear gate, what you're hearing. That was last week. Eye gate, what are you focusing on? Because if whatever your focus, whatever you focus on 
is, is how your perception is being forged. You focus on the negative long enough, you'll have a negative attitude about life. You just will. You focus on loneliness long enough, you'll have a loneliness attitude about life. You focus on poverty long enough, you will live an impoverished life because your perception will be molded by what you focus on the most. So now notice it says here, let the word of God not depart from your eyes. Now, let's look at that. Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> Don't let the word of God out. You know, it's good. It's good to quote scripture. It's good. Nothing wrong with it. But it's wrong if that's all you do. <clears throat> there comes a time where quoting won't work. You got to open that book up and put your eye on it. In other words, you may have eaten a sweet potato before. And you know how that thing tastes, and it's wonderful. But the memory of a sweet potato is not going to nourish you. You can't be sitting up on the edge of your bed, hungry, or having eaten in three days, and start thinking about a sweet potato and get full. You're going to probably get a little hungrier. Well, that's the same thing with the Word of God. You can deplete the energy of the Word of God that you looked at yesterday, and now you're trying to quote it today and think it's going to have the same strength. It's not. There are times where you have to open up your book and find where it is written and read it. Put your eyes on it. Now, let's look here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. Notice here. Looking unto Jesus. Well, how do we look unto Jesus? Isn't Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven? How do we look all the way? Are we supposed to look all the way to heaven and try to see if we can see him down here? No. We know what this means. St. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And it says, and the Word did what? Became flesh, and we beheld. We saw the Word walk the street, the, the shores of Galilee. If I'm going to look to Jesus, Jesus is the Word. So if we're going to looking unto Jesus or looking unto the Word of God, which is the author and the finisher of your faith. Looking to the word of God, which is the source and the finishing of your faith. It requires faith to do anything. So if I'm going to sustain and keep the advantage over the devil, then I'm going to look in the word of God to get the faith that I need to withstand him. And then I'm going to keep my eye on the word of God to, to keep my faith strong enough to overcome him. And then I'm going to keep looking in the word of God to make sure that my faith is strong enough to keep him underneath my feet. See, you never get to the place where you, you quit looking to the word of God. You got to look to the word of God to start it. You got to look to the word of God while you're in it. And you got to look to the word of God to stay on top. That's why it says he is the author, the source, and the finisher. Without the word of God in there the complete time, then there's always, uh, you're always going to be vulnerable to deception. Looking to the word of God, Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, of the throne of God. Notice, who for the joy that was set before him. What joy was set before him? Well, you got to go back and read what was going on then and go and, and, and run the reference. Basically, what it comes out to is while he's hanging on the cross, he is quoting what he has read from the book of Psalms. And he set that picture 
of what God promised him. And I, you read, you find in Isaiah, you can find through the Psalms. He took the word of God that he had meditated on, and that became the picture that set before him that gave him the strength to do what he did. Not only did it give him the strength to overcome what was going on, but it also did what? Set him at the right hand of the Father. It also put him in a position of authority. Where it all comes from, the word of God. For consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against him, lest you be weary and do what? Faint in your mind. Without the word of God, you will faint in your mind. I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how strong you are or you were. The moment you put the word of God down and you continue and you stop looking into it, you are weakening spiritually. And, uh, and if you continue to go that direction, there will eventually come a time when you faint in your mind. That means give up. It doesn't all happen overnight. That's why you can come to church and you can sit up on the word of God and you're, getting, you're hearing the word of God and your spirit, man, it starts surging. And then you get out of here in a few days that boldness that you had to do that thing is kind of gone. What happened? You didn't continue to look into the word of God to keep that thing surging. And it, the, moment you, the moment you set it down, it starts to lose strength. That's why it says it's the source and the finisher. You got to have it the whole way through to keep it strong the whole way through. You need the same level of potency at the beginning. You need that at the end. And all the way through, you, it doesn't, you, you don't need to peak and then, then loll out. No, you need to be strong all the time. Why? Because your adversary isn't taking a day off. He's not taking a break. And a lot of times with us as God's people, what's going on is, is that we get these surges and we start things and then we fall off. And then we come back, we surge again, and we fall off. And we come back, we surge again, and we fall off. What's happening? We're not making any progression. And eventually that brings about frustration. God, why is not working? Why are you asking God why it's not working? You, you, why aren't you working? See, we've got to quit blaming God for it. So I got to get my eyes. I got to get my ears inclined to hear it. I got to set my eyes on the word of God. I got to keep them in the word of God. I cannot look at the things that, of, that, are, that, are, that are visible. Remember the word of God says, because the things that are visible are what? Temporal. They're changeable. I don't care if you got $10 million stacked up in the bank. You can't look at that and be like, I'm secure. Because you get a $10 million problem tomorrow. I heard someone say, you know, if someone showed up at, if, 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 if some bill collector showed up at Bill Gates' door, knocked on it, knock, 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 you know, uh, we're here and we're here to serve you this because, you know, you, you didn't pay that $20,000 bill and it's in default. That don't, that don't make him nervous. $20,000 bills, oh, let me reach and get some lint out of my pocket and pay that. Here, take that. Here, it's paid. No problem. Why? Because the man has multiple, 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 he's a billionaire. So $20,000 ain't going to bother him. But you let somebody show up and knock on his door, knock, knock, knock. Well, you know what? You started such, 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 and now we, we, we need about $3.4 $3. billion now that you behind in debt. Now, he may miss some nights of sleep. Why? Because now we bump it up against his comfort zone. Because his eyes on his money. But what I'm saying to you, if your eyes on the word of God, no, if that's your source, it doesn't really matter what you bump up against. You have the answer. Looking unto Jesus. He's your source. He's the supplier. He's your strengthener. He's your standby. He's going to help you. You do not allow the pressures of life to get on you and cause you to retreat into whatever you used to retreat to to medicate yourself. Whether the medication is food, whether the medication is work, whether the medication is women, 
whether the medication is drugs or alcohol. All of them are the same thing. People cope with things differently. When the pressure comes, the reason that you fall back into those areas is because you think you got to handle the pressure by yourself. What you need to do is make the shift, cast, shift it over on him. The pressure comes, you don't succumb, you run to the word so you can dump it over on him. Because he'll carry for you. Get it? He carries for you. You dump it over. It carries the idea of a man trying to carry this back-breaking load all by himself down the street, and he's barely making it, and it's breaking him down, and, 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 and he's bent over, and he's almost buckling at the knees trying to shoulder this thing to move it down the street, and then all of a sudden, somebody walks up to you with a beast that can carry that that's strong enough and says, now, just toss it, talk, lean here and talk, and you toss the thing over on the, on the horse that can handle it, you get to stand up straight and grab the reins and just, and walk. No struggle at all. Why? Something else is shouldering your weight. Well, this is what this says. Cast the burdens of that thing over on, on, on him because he cared for you and you can just walk with him because he can handle it. You can't. You don't medicate yourself and, 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 and start feeling sorry for yourself and start waving a white flag for yourself and run back into your corner. That's what the devil wants you to do. Because that's where he, now he has the advantage and he's running the show again. And anytime Satan is running the show and he has the advantage, you're losing. You're being stolen from, you're being robbed for, uh, from, and eventually you will be, you, he, he, eventually it can come over to the place of killing you and, and, and snuffing your life out. So now he says, put your eyes on him. Now let's go back to Proverbs, because I want to finish this up today. Now, so he says, let them not depart from thy eyes. Keep it in the midst of your heart. Keep it in the center of your heart. Why? For they, what? What are the they? The words. The revelation that comes from the words. For they are life to those that find them. Or the words are life unto those who receive the revelation of them. And the word and revelation becomes medicine. The word health there is medicine to all of your flesh. This is why, uh, Lord, I'm going to take a little side journey here for a second. This is why, any, we put it this way, any normal man under no, normal circumstances, the stuff that Jesus went through leading up to his hanging on the cross would have killed him alone. When they beat you the way that they beat, beat folks on that whipping post, they died. That's why when that guard came out there, that guard was angry because Potter says you can flog him but don't kill him. They almost beat him to death. And that guard was like, what are y'all doing? That is not the command I gave y'all. He should have died there. Then they drug him place to place, no water, no food. Beating him over the head with sticks. He's hemorrhaging, he's losing blood because that wasn't just a few weps on the man's back. That was hunks and chunks of flesh pulled off him to the place to where bone could be exposed in areas, muscle exposed in area. They beat him to almost to death. And still he had to carry his cross to the hill to be hung on. And then hung there for some hours with stakes in him. And still hadn't died. They eventually, he eventually had to do what? Give up his spirit himself. What was going on? The, me- the, the word is medicine to all your flesh. Just as quick as they was, the devil was trying to kill it, the word of God was strengthening him. It couldn't kill him. He couldn't be killed. That's why it says, you don't take my life. I have to lay it down. You can't kill me. Why? Because he's perpetually rebuilding the strength within there. 
And you know the Lord showed it to me? It's found in Romans chapter 8. It says, if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he that raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal body. So as quick as the enemy was trying to kill him, God was giving life to his mortal body because he was standing on that word. Now, that's a little side journey, but it's what it says. It's medicine to all your flesh. It works, folks. And then he goes on, he says here, put away from thee a forward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. The third gateway into your life, your mouth. What are you saying? Now, Why did he reserve the mouth to the end? I believe the mouth, well, your mouth is the instrument of your faith. Actually, the mouth controls the force that you live under. And I believe the reason that it's last here is because the first two have a, have, have, will dictate what comes out your mouth. What you listen to, what you focus on is what's in your heart, and that's what your mouth will speak. All right? Now, let's look at these. Get your mouth right. Now, let's just take a journey. We'll just read several scriptures here. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 10. Because there's so much we could say about this, but I'm just going to just give us a few. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 11, the mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. Where does life come from? It comes from the mouth of a righteous man. Because you speak what? Words of life. Let's look also at Proverbs chapter 13. And in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 2, a man shall eat good of the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the transgressor shall, be, shall eat violence. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth his mouth wide, his lips shall have destruction. Notice, the mouth produces life. The righteous man's mouth produces life. And then it says, he that puts a guard on what comes out of his mouth shall keep his life. So the life is produced by, with the tongue and is kept by the tongue. What you're saying. See, what you're saying either gives Satan the advantage or it gives you the advantage. What are you saying? Let's continue to look, at, look, look into it. Proverbs 18. Verse 20, a man's belly should be satisfied with the fruit of his lips, I mean, fruit of his mouth, rather. And with the increase of his lips, shall he be filled? Notice, a man's belly or a man's life, or we could put it this way, a man's, a man's uh, inward capacity to, uh, 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 how can we put it? Your inward container for life. Remember, it says, for out of for out of you flow the force of life. It's a container that houses it down on the inside. So, so it says, by your mouth, a man's belly, life, shall be filled. You fill it up with what you say. Now, here's what's important. Whatever you focus on the most is what you're going to be saying. If all you see and talk about, if, I mean, if all you see and hear is poverty, that's what you talk. If all you hear and see is death and destruction, that's what you talk. But if I set my eye on the word of God, set my ear to hear God's words, then I'm going to say what I read. And I'm going to say what I hear him say. And that's what's come out of my mouth. You got to do it that way. But then he goes on, says death and life are in the power of. Of God. Is that what it says? 
Y'all sitting there like, yeah, that's what it says. No, that's not what it says. It says life and death in the power of God's tongue. Well, life and death in the power of the devil's tongue that's, that's speaking to you. No, it's in the power of your tongue. You control death and life when it comes to you. Not God, not the devil, you. What are you saying? Because once you've determined what you're going to say and you, once that's been made up in your mind, then you license that little pink thing in your mouth to set the direction for you. It, be, it, it becomes the power of attorney over your life. Whatever you license it to do, that's what it says, that's what you have. That's what you read, that's what you watched. You, 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 you sit there and, and you look at Empire, episode one, season one, and you look at the whole things on your DVR, and you don't look at the whole first season, the second season, and getting ready for the third season, if that's, if that's you, and you wonder why you kind of got cookies ways. <laughs> well, hey. And you kind of got the little sharp tongue like cookie. Well, hey, that's what you've been meditating. I mean, we laugh, but then you, 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 that's, I, I, you know, you know who taught me this? The Lord taught me this. I didn't even realize what was going on. Until after I got saved, I listened to too much, so much Tupac music and all that rap stuff. And one of my favorite songs was All I Want to Be is a Gangster, a Gangster. I don't know if that's the name of the song, but it was a song by Tupac. Had a nice little beat, bass beat to it, and I'll play it every day. That was one of my favorite songs. And found myself, all I want to do is trying to be a gangster. Didn't know what was going on. Doing stuff else, way outside my character. Didn't realize any of what was going on until after I got saved. The Lord started pointing me. I found the scripture. And the Lord started pointing me back and began to show me how my life was mirroring the things that I was focusing on. And it was driving me to do things that wasn't even a part of my character. Because every day I'm walking down the halls at school talking about I'm a gangster. <laughs> and everything else that I was saying. We laugh, but you did it too. And we all did it. But it's what you listen to. It's what you read. It's what you focus on. It's what you allow into the gates of your life that dictates how you live that life. All right, one more. Proverbs 22. This is why... When your kids are young, spend the time building a capacity for God and his word into their life. Spend the time teaching them to talk right. Teaching them to say the right thing over themselves. You don't call your kids stupid dumb, good for nothing. You don't say that to a child. Those things get in there and they're put in there over a process of time and when they grow up, you hear it in their voice. I can't. I'll never. Where those words come from? Good for nothing, dumb and stupid. You build and you blessed. Yeah. Stop telling your kids you can be anything you want to be when you grow up. That's a lie from hell. Don't you ever tell your kids that again. And anyone looking at this on YouTube is a lie from hell. Quit telling your kids you can be anything you want to be when you grow up. No, they need to be what God created them to be. Amen. That's what they need to find out. What is my destiny? Why am I here? And then fulfill that purpose. Because trying to be something else, you're outside the will of God. And you're going to make your life hard. The Lord taught me that lesson too. It's easy when you know who you are and what God created you to do, and you do that. Life is easy. Things happen. The anointing, all of your giftings and everything begin to function. Why? Because you're in the place that God designed you to be. You're not a square peg anymore trying to fit into a round hole. Now, let's look at this one here. And we're in with this one. Verse 17 from the Amplified Bible. Listen that word listen means consent and submit. 
That's where we started. Incline thy ear. I, I mean, attend rather. Attend to my words. The definition for attend was consent and submit. So we write back here again. Listen, consent and submit to the words of the wise. And apply your mind to my knowledge. For it will be pleasant if you keep them in your mind believing them. Your lips will become accustomed to confessing them. If you put the word there, attend to it, submit to it, it says here, if you make the determination to apply that knowledge and keep it in you, your mouth will become accustomed to saying it. So that your trust, belief, reliance, support, and confidence may be in the Lord. I have made known these things uh, to you today, even today, even to you. Amen. How do you train your mouth to speak the word of God? You submit to it and you keep it in your mouth, you keep it in your ears, you keep it in your eyes, you keep it in your ears, you keep it in your eyes. It's a, it's a continual process. It goes, if you'll utilize this correctly, you get the Bible, you find the scripture, you put it in your eyes, you read it out loud with your mouth, it goes into your ears, and then it goes all over. You, you see it with your eyes, you see it with your mouth, it goes to your ears. It's a circle that you build, that God used to build a capacity in you for victory can nobody stop it can nobody change it can nobody make you not do it the only person that is involved with that is you this is why when it comes to your faith can nobody stop you because you have the determination you have you're the determining factor on how strong or how weak you're going to be not the devil not man you Because you can pick your Bible if you live in a country where you can pick up the word of God anytime you get ready. And now we live in, we live in a society now to where the scriptures are at the ready any given time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of a year. Well, I don't have a Bible. Do you have a phone? Yes, it's on there. The tablet, it's on there. A laptop is on it. A desktop is on it. Put the CD in there. It's on it. You are never, ever in a place where you are void of the word of God. It is there. And you can focus on it. Well, Pastor, you know, what about those people that live in country and in their Bibles? You know what those people do? They get little pieces of paper, little pieces of card, and, and, and they, they, have a, they have a couple of pages of a Bible that they don't tore out. And, and they, 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 are, they are all, they're getting there and they'll write those scriptures out for themselves and write them on their little pieces of paper and hide them or, or have a little, uh, uh, they still got the word of God. And all they may have is three pages out of a Bible, but I guarantee with them three pages out of that Bible, they can change their whole world because they, they're doing it. They take those three, let me tell you something, God got more, it is more in Jesus' whip than all the wisdom in this world past, present, and future. God can, God can take Jesus' wept, save, heal, deliver, set free, and prosper every individual on the face of the earth with those two words. If that's all you had and you read them, you put your eyes on them, you read them, you confess them, you take them, you believe them, and let the Holy Spirit go to work with Jesus' wept, there wouldn't be nothing that you couldn't get done in your life. And that's all the word you had. Two words. And we got 66 books of them. And you still can't win? Nah, something, something wrong with you. Nothing wrong with the word. So I hope this series has blessed you. You have the authority, not the devil. Stop letting him have advantage over you.